All right, folks, welcome to a Friday edition of Second City's Board Zoom style. Zoom, zoom. <laughs> I'm Akita B. You can follow me at Keena McGee on Twitter, at Keena underscore McGee on the Instagram. And I'm Lamont Scott, and you can follow me at Lamont Scott on Facebook, Lamont Scott 69 on Instagram, and Lamont Scott 16 on Twitter. All right, we're happy to be joined by radio news editor and sports anchor reporter for WBBM Radio. He is Brad Robinson. Brad, how are you? Where can people find you on social media? I'm good. Uh, you can find me at Brad Robinson 8 on Twitter. All right, nice. We got a lot to get to, okay, fellas. Let's get right to it. Hopefully, Seth will join us in a little bit. But let's talk about the White Sox. Unfortunately, the lights, the White Sox. <laughs> Uh, lost a tough one to the A's, ending their season, losing the best of three series. They had 28 men left on base during the whole series. Brad, also, never mind that, the pitching, too. I mean, Dunning, you know, started that he left after a couple of innings, and who else? Uh, uh, came in, like, in the third, and then he pulled something on his muscle. And I, uh, uh, Brad, what the heck happened? <laughs> Well, I, you know, th this is kind of the funny thing about a short season like this, right? The White Sox had a really bad week and a half. And that's really all it was. Outside of that, they were great all year. And over the course of 162 games, a bad week and a half happens uh, multiple times. And you just kind of play your way out of it. And you make up some of those games on the back end. And, you know, in a 60-game season with the uh, uh, best of three playoff series, that bad week happens at a bad time. That's pretty much it. So, um, you know, the – Listen, the bats are, are awesome, and they've got a very bright future, but, you know, they just kind of started slumping at the wrong time, that, and they weren't able to, to pick out of it because, you know, when they started struggling, that, that would have been like May in the regular season, right? So you've got all summer to fix it. Unfortunately, that's just not the case this year. Yeah, that, that, was, that was unfortunate, Brad. I mean, like – and, and, and a lot of people was trying to blame it on the youth and all of that. Like you said, he just had a bad week and a half pretty much. I mean, mm -hmm. overall, I'm still happy. Like, even in the midst of losing that game, I wasn't feeling sad or anything. It was like, our future is so bright, we need shades. And as Tom used to say by Mr. Corby Hart, <laughs> you know, we need shades, so to speak. So I'm not upset at all. They do have a lot of interesting decisions to make. A lot of people would think, what are they going to do next? I hope they're going to continue to build. They have some interesting decisions they got to make with McCann and with their closing situation. And, you know, I'm hoping they want to still continue to go forward. You know? Yeah, they, they remind me a lot of the 2015 Cubs where, you know, a third place finish despite being really good all year. Um, you know, close but not quite there yet. They do need to add some arms because they've had a lot of injuries in their pitching rotation. So, you know, I, I mean – if they want to, if they want to dish out some money and go get a guy like Trevor Bauer, that would really help their rotation. They, they yep. just, they simply need to stock arms because the hitters are there and they're going to be here for a while and they are really good. And they, they need some front, they need some good pitching. They need some top end pitching. Mm -hmm. And I, and, that, and even with the younger guys, that way you don't have to rush these younger guys. Like we depending on a Kopech to come back after two years. We depending on. I hope that kid is not hurt yesterday. You say he was feeling pain. I don't think they've done the MRI on him yet. So we don't know what's going on with him. So I think, like you said, they need to go out and get a, an arm. Really, right? Another important part, they need to see what they're going to do with James McCann. Now, mm -hmm. do we keep him on that team? Because listening to his speech yesterday, it was sounding like a goodbye speech almost. It was like, okay, and I really don't want to see him leave town. Yeah, I mean, backup catcher isn't a hugely important role. I mean, it, it, it helps for development and things of that nature. But what James McCann brings to that Lucas Giolito relationship and the yes, way he sir. elevates Giolito, it's probably worth it just to bring him back and have a reliable guy there that, that can help make one of your healthy starters an ace. Yep, and even if you use him in a DH role when he's not catching, you know, maybe you can speak to him and say, you're going to play every day, mm -hmm. get him back. But I think that's a really important sign. And I know a couple of teams probably going to be calling, but I do think we may need to try to hold on to him simply for everything that he brings to the table. Yeah, I, I, I agree. He's exactly what you want out of that backup catcher role from a leadership standpoint. And as Sid joins us, Sid, what you got, what you got for Brad? 
Hey, Brad, nice to, nice to see you again. I don't know if you can see him wearing uh, the good old shirt. Ah, the sporting news shirt. <laughs> oh, man, I lost mine years ago. That's beautiful. <laughs> yeah. But uh, if you discussed this already, I apologize. But um, give us your, your overall evaluation of, of starting pitcher Lucas Giolito. He had, he had a heck of a game one, um, pitched a uh, six-plus innings of no-hit ball to give the Sox the only playoff victory. But give us your evaluation of him over the last couple of years because when he was here from the Washington trade, uh, he struggled out of the gate, but he proved to me that he's a worthy uh, top-two starter over these last couple of years. Yeah, Giolito is a guy who was a really highly touted prospect. And while he was in Washington's system, he kind of took a huge nosedive and he struggled a while. That's why he was even made available to the White Sox. So when he got here, he was kind of in the midst of a little bit of a, a career crisis. Um, but, but guys that have talent and guys that have the willingness to, uh, to learn and adapt and adjust, you know, he's, he's one of those guys. And, and we've seen over the last couple of years, um, him really kind of grow into that talent that he has, which, you know, not all pitchers do that. A lot of pitchers can throw the ball 100 miles an hour, but they never really learn how to deal with the, uh, the mental load of, of pitching to big league hitters. <laughs> so, you know, Giolito's uh, development to me is, is a huge plus for the White Sox. Now, Brad, what do you think about uh, – I, th I know you, you know, Lou Lamont talked about it just a couple minutes ago. What do you think the, the White Sox need to do to kind of – be right there to be that consistent contender for the next few years because is Renteria the answer? Do you get rid of him? And if not, do you who do you bring in? So maybe we'll pull the rest of the Yeah, I'm sure Ozzy kind of you know, sort of made no secret that he might be interested in coming back again. But what do you think? Well, you know, I don't think Renteria is going anywhere just based on the way the White Sox do business. And, and the level of loyalty that these they give the Reinsdorf family gives these guys, not just the White Sox, but the Bulls too, right? So there's, you know, Renteria is a guy who's, who's pretty well-liked within the organization. He's well-liked within the clubhouse. That's always kind of been um, what he does best is relate to players. He's not a very good tactical manager, really. He's, he's better as, as a bench coach than a manager. But uh, I, I think the, the Reinsdorf family and the way the White Sox work they'll probably want to give him a full year to see what he can do with this roster. I don't think he's necessarily the answer, but you know, this roster is so talented. I think they could win with him. I think they could win with anybody uh, as far as what they need on the roster. It's just arms, arms, arms. You know, you, the, the issue with Kopik, who is supposed to be a, a huge part of the rotation, you know, he, the, the struggles with depression, the injury history, you know, there's a lot of question marks there, and, and it sounds callous because you don't want to, you know, talk about a guy's mental state in that capacity, but, you know, he's talked openly about it, so there's a little concern there. Carlos Rodon is another guy who is expected to be a huge part of the rotation. You know, injuries happen there. I've always thought even when Dylan Cease was with the Cubs, I thought he was kind of best suited for a back end of the bullpen kind of, kind of role because he's got such electric stuff. So the White, White Sox, what they really need is just to – build a ton of depth in that in that starting rotation so if some guys come back healthy great but if not they have backup plans and uh to piggyback off what you were just saying sir with the arms 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 do you think they may need to do something with their pitching coach and how do you think that pitching coach relationship with Renteria will be going forward with all of these new arms that we know will be coming in eventually do you think maybe moving away from Mr. Cooper or is moving into a new role with someone else? How do you think that may work? And do you think they need to do something along those lines? Yeah, I mean, I, I'd be, again, I'd be surprised based on the way the Reinsdorfs operate and the loyalty they have to these guys. And, and Coop has been here for so long now that, that he's just kind of an ingrained part of the organization. I don't think it would be necessarily a bad thing to move on from him and, and go get a, a new pitching coach. Anytime a guy is... Uh, it reaches the age that Coop's at and has been doing this as long as he's been doing it. I always wonder how he's relating to a younger generation of player and person, right? Because mm -hmm. a 20 year old now is not the same as a 20 year old 20 years ago. You know, people evolve and people change and generations are different. So uh, I do wonder how he, you know, communicates with these guys because, because I don't see it firsthand, but, yeah, I think if, if they were to make a change on the co coaching staff, that might be the most uh, most likely scenario. But even then, I don't think it's going to happen. Me. Either. 
Brad Robinson at WBBM uh, News Radio 780 and 105.9. Join us here on Sega City Sports Zoom style. Hello with Lakina McGee and Lamont Scott. I am Sydney Brown. Brad, sticking with the White Sox, Jose Abreu, I said he should be your hands down American League MVP for 2020. Coming into the season, I thought that his numbers would take a dip a little bit because he didn't have to carry the lineup anymore, especially with Eloy Jimenez and Luis Robert, who we'll get into later. But talk about Jose Abreu. It seemed to me that he took his game to a whole nother level this year. Yeah, you want to talk about a huge bounce back year. You're talking about a guy who was really good for a while, but the, over the last year or two, it's kind of seen a little bit of a downward slope. You know, he, he hasn't fallen off the cliff for anything, but right. the, the numbers didn't quite match up to where they were his first couple of years in the league. And uh, I mean, to come out and play at an MVP caliber level um, and to do it when he's been so heavily counted on to kind of be um, a guide for a lot of the Latino players on that team. You got a lot of young Latino players in Luis Robert and Eloy Jimenez and Yoan Moncada and, uh, uh, you know, Abreu was kind of asked to take all those guys under his wing and show them the ways. And that's a lot of pressure on a guy. So to be able to keep his playing um, at a level that he was with all those extra responsibilities to me is, is just incredibly impressive. Where does Tim Anderson fit into this? Because there are some people say he should get some MVP love as well. Um, yeah, I think they're probably – going to end up splitting some votes. So it might be difficult for one of the two to win. Uh, Anderson's were, I mean, that guy, it, it, he became the, the best shortstop in this city and one of the best shortstops in the league really, really fast. I mean, he is exciting. He's electric. He's everything you want in a shortstop, right? So I, I think that him and Abreu may split some votes. Um, so it might be difficult for either one to win, but, but both of them are, are incredibly worthy. Yeah, yeah, you know, and I was saying, I was going to mention Tim Anderson again. Like, you know, they like to say he's the face of the franchise, so to speak. I mean, do you think with more responsibility with him as his stature grows, you think that may affect his game because he can seem erratic sometimes? You think as he grows in stature, his game may suffer? Or do you think this trajectory to this MVP player will continue going forward? Uh, I think he likes this role. You know, when he, when he first came in the league, he was a, a little bit quiet, as younger guys are, and he's really grown into a, into a vocal leader on the team and somebody who, who leads both on and off the field, who talks about, um, you know, social issues, who puts himself out there. And it seems to me he's really developed into a, a person who kind of likes to, to take on that spotlight and to take on that pressure. So, um, yeah, I, I don't see it affecting his play at all, if anything. I think it makes him stronger because he becomes more comfortable with himself and the, and the person he puts out there. I agree with you. <laughs> That's exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sticking with the White Sox outfield, Brad, uh, my opinion on Eloy Jimenez, as I call him on Twitter, must see TV, but his play in the outfield is less than stellar. I said uh, a couple months ago, if, if it was up to me, if I was Rick Hahn, I would make – Eloy Jimenez, my permanent DH. And maybe it seems like he's maybe headed that way in the next couple of years or so. We had your colleague on, Dave Kerner, on a month ago. He said he thinks that the White Sox may come to that decision within the next 18 months or so. If you were in charge of the White Sox, oh, how long would it realistically would, would, would it take to, uh, to come to that decision that Eloy Jimenez would be your permanent DH? Yeah, I mean, Eloy is uh, kind of the perfect fit for DH, right? Uh, although you also have to wonder how a guy is going to handle the responsibility of just hitting as opposed to being in the field and being engaged, you know, in, in both halves of the inning. Some guys don't come off the bench cold and, and hit very well. Some guys do it really well. I think Eloy would do it extremely well. So, um, you know, the, the thing is you can win with a horrible defensive left fielder. I mean, look at Manny Ramirez, right? The guy's the worst defensive <laughs> outfielder I've ever seen, but he mashed. And it didn't matter all that much that he was still able to win. Eloy probably has to hit at that level for his defense not to matter because it's really that bad. Uh, so I think, yeah, DH is exactly where I'd put him. All right, so let's let's go to the uh, Northside North for a second. Cubs are playing to 
tan today. They were supposed to play yesterday, but they didn't because of weather. <laughs> yeah. weather. You can make your own <laughs> conclusions about that. that. <laughs> exactly. But uh, you, Darvish, is on the mound today. Do you think the Cubs extend the series? And if they do, can they end up winning it? I, I think that's a lot more up to the Cubs position players than it is to you, Darvish. Darvish has been awesome. He's been lights out. Darvish could give up one run in eight innings, but if they aren't scoring, they aren't winning. And their problem lately is that they haven't been scoring. So, you know, so much of it's going to lie on, on, on Javi and Chris Bryant. And, you know, that, those core four guys, uh, Wilson Contreras, Anthony Rizzo, man, they haven't shown up this year. It's, it's kind of amazing that given the fact that, that they've gotten so little from their key offensive players, they've had a, a hurt and shallow starting rotation and a bullpen that's been thrown together like in chaos and they still managed to win as many games as they did. It's pretty surprising to me because nothing ever really seemed to be working at one time for the Cubs. Okay. And now, uh, and I'm already assuming that they will win today. That's why I got that on. <laughs> what do they do as far as the next game and going to that next round with this pitching staff? I mean, is he going to throw Lester out there? Is he ready? What do you think they should, and what do you think they're going to do going forward once they win today? i say that again. Yeah, if they win today, uh, it'll be Lester on Saturday. You know, he's, uh, he's earned that right. It could be the last start of his career. It could be the last start of his Cubs career. Who knows? Um, and they don't have a whole lot of options to go with, right? I mean, you kind of have to ride or die with Big John because he's been your guy through this whole era of winning that they've that they've gone through over the past five, six years. So, uh, yeah, definitely Lester would be the guy. And if it is Lester, got to bring the bats, man, because, you know, he's, he's not the guy that's going to give you, you know, eight innings of shutout ball anymore. Uh, speaking of that Cubs pitching staff, Brad, Alec Mills, he threw, his, of course, his first career no-hitter at Milwaukee last month. What do you see as his future? Will it be in the Cubs uniform or – do you think he'll be traded for some pieces down the road? I mean, it, you know, if they're looking to make deals and, and uh, there's a team looking to unload talent and kind of take on cheaper um, cheaper guys that can just take a spot. I love you, Josh. Talk yeah, later. Be careful. You know, I, I, I could see Mills getting, de getting dealt. I don't think he's a guy that they're planning to build a rotation around. He's just kind of a warm body that's there. The no-hitter was awesome, and it was a lot of fun is Philip Umber, right? Like, yeah. just the most <laughs> unexpected, like, where the hell did this come from thing? Like Andy yeah. Hump, no hitter. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, Mills, Mills has been fine, but he's a bottom-of-the-rotation starter on pretty much any team, I'd say, and, and maybe even, like, a, a sixth or seventh, you know, swingman, you know, bullpen-type guy on, an, on some of the better teams. So, yeah, the, the no-hitter was fun because it was so unexpected, but I, I, I wouldn't go – too crazy on expecting him to be a huge part of things. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let, let, okay. Let's go to the Bears for a second, Brad. Um, the Bears are probably the most unpredictable, undeserving, however you want to say it, three and O team uh -huh. in in the NFL. Um, what's your assessment here of the Bears, and do you think they can keep the ride going against Indy? Um, I do think they can keep the ride going against Indy. It'll be fun to see what Nick Foles looks like in a full game. Uh, but the Bears are so weird because I don't know that I've ever seen a, a 3-0 and team that I just have no idea if they're any good or not. You know, and I, I think part of that is because the weird season without the preseason, without the long uh, training camp, you know, guys are still kind of feeling their way into things um, just because of the whole, all the COVID restrictions and the way things have been done differently. Um, but yeah, it's a team that's looked really good um, coming from behind. They've looked good in the fourth quarters, but they've looked pretty darn bad getting to the to that point in the fourth quarter where they need to come from behind. So, um, you know, I think Foles brings a, lo a lot different kind of uh, skill set than what Trubisky brought um, as far as like a mental attributes, being able to, to um, carry out a game plan, just kind of having a feel for what's going on around him. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how the, the offense responds with a different quarterback in the whole game. But uh, she's, I don't know if they're any good. I really don't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, a a two-part for you, sir. Uh, do you think that defense is a bigger problem than most people are making or paying attention to right now? 
And what do you think our answer would be at punt return, especially after the comments that Cordell Patterson made? He didn't say he's not a punt returner, but he said he catched the ball or something of that nature he made reference to. I don't think he's too enthusiastic about being a punt returner. So what do you think they do about that? And what do you think about that defense? Do you think it is in trouble going forward and it's not living up to what it's supposed to be? Well, you know, so much of that depends on the health of Robert Quinn, because in order to get a pass rush, you got to have somebody on the other side of the line that's going to draw some attention defensively. Khalil Mack can't get held by three guys every play like he has been, right? I mean, that guy's a beast. And we see him fighting through these, the, <laughs> he's held on every dang play. Yeah, every got to get somebody else that can make plays. And, you know, it's just, Trevathan isn't making plays the way he was last year or the year before. He's slowed down a little bit. I'm not sure where Roquan is. He's, you know, <laughs> not, not the guy we thought he was going to be after his rookie year. Right. But, but they need that big pass rusher on the other side. So if Quinn's healthy, I think the defense is going to start looking a lot better because if you get that pass rush, all of a sudden the guys on the back end of the defense start looking better. You don't need as tight of coverage for as long. So it really is kind of a domino effect on how, uh, you know, you pressure the quarterback, you give the, the secondary a lot more time to, to do what they have to do. So, I, man, I, I'm, I still think the defense is very good. Um, but, yeah, they've been a bit concerning the last couple of weeks. Heading down, the home stretch with, heading down the home stretch with Brad Robinson of News Radio 780 and 105.9 FM WBBM right here on Second City Sports Zoom style. Brad, let's switch over to the Bears offense. Of course, Allen Robinson is your number one stud wide right receiver waiting for a contract extension. But I want to focus in on the number two wide receiver. Who is it? Anthony Miller has called two game-winning touchdowns at Detroit and at Atlanta. But you have rookie Darnell Mooney is constantly uh, starting to make plays. I like his potential. In your opinion, who should be the Bears' number two wide receiver next to Robinson? Just, just based on experience, I think you got to give it to Miller at this point. Uh, Mooney, is, he's so new, and lining up in the slot for him is a really good thing because you're matching him up with more safeties and more nickelbacks rather than the, the best guys on the, uh, on the other side of the secondary. So um, I'd say Miller should be the number two guy. Miller's been very frustrating, though. You know, at times he yeah. looks remarkable, and at times you just want to, you know, pull your hair out of your head because the, <laughs> some of the best passes we've seen, be it Foles or Trubisky this year, just going right through his hands, right? So, uh, you know, they've talked about it in the past with, with Miller, the concentration factor, maybe bringing in a, uh, a veteran guy who's got a Super Bowl ring and, and who's, you know, a little bit more heady like, like Foles might be able to help a guy like Miller. And like they said with that game-winning touchdown pass, Foles told him, you know, what was it? Just go to the L, right, in, yeah. in, the, uh, in, in the end zone. He said, I'm going to get hit. Just go to the L. I'm throwing it to the L. Just be there. Maybe that's the kind of, you know, hand-holding he needs. Um, Play great. So, you know, I, I, I like Miller's skill set. He's got to catch the ball more, though. Let's go to the hardwood for a second for the, with the Bulls, Brad. On the Bulls, have a new head coach. And Billy Donovan, seems like Atreus Karnitravis and Mark Eversley are starting to do their thing in the front office. Where do you see the Bulls, you know, in, this, in these new, all these new faces? Well, it's nice to see them with a, a, a reasonable NBA head coach. You know, I, I, don't feel, I feel like the Bulls haven't had an actual NBA head coach since, I don't know, maybe like Scott Skiles. And, and Thibodeau did a really nice job. I always thought of him more as, as the, uh, like a, a good bench coach defensive-minded bench coach just because he's had such a weird personality, right? And <laughs> I, I don't, you know, he, he almost like a rain man kind of thing with basketball, you know, he just like <laughs> so oh. vision. So, um, you know, Donovan is, he's, he's a legitimate NBA head coach coming in to, to evaluate some of these players that, you know, frankly, the Bulls have had for years and are still question marks because they haven't had any, any real true guidance on that team. So, um, I like what I'm seeing from them. I think it's going to be a while until they are really good again or can build the pieces around Don, uh, Donovan that they need. Uh, so I don't expect a huge turnaround in year one. But, but what it is is it's a start to change the culture and shift the culture, which is something the Bulls have needed 
since Michael Jordan left. Well, I mean, they needed it when Michael Jordan was there too, because culture's always been an issue <laughs> with the Bulls front office and ownership. So um, I, I like that they're kind of bringing in more, uh, more credentialed and, and smarter basketball people to kind of lead the way now. Okay, since we got you on basketball and speaking of head coaches and speaking out, do you think Steve Nash needs to make a public comment regarding what KD and Kyrie has been saying over the last couple of days? Or do you think they just flat out don't respect the process of leadership over there? I mean, how do you think that's going to turn out? Do you think you need to say something about that? Well, I think if he doesn't say anything publicly, he'll probably say something privately. You know, I mean, that's, that's, that's KD's handpicked choice, right? To, to, lead, to lead that team, or at least that's what it seems like. So, uh, yeah, I think the, the, the lines of communication got to be open when you got a, a new young rookie head coach coming in and a star the caliber that KD is. Yeah, you, you got to have open lines of communication to get all of it out there so you can move forward. Last question for me, Brad. Let's do that hockey as Chance the Rapper would say. Uh, the, <laughs> Chicago, the Chicago Blackhawks actually won a playoff series, the qualifying round over Edmonton, three games to one, of course, before losing to Las Vegas in five games. Of course, John, uh, before that time, John McDonough, the now former president, is out. Jeremy Carlton still the head coach, and Stan Bowman still your GM. Of course, the large Hawks fan base have choice words for both those gentlemen. We're not going to say it on this broadcast because it's a family show. But um, again, give us your honest opinion about the Blackhawks. Do you think that this seat, uh, that this past season was was a blip in the road and they'll go back to losing, or do you think they'll build something with this new core before Kane and Taves start turning uh, old and hopefully not, but maybe p potential injuries getting ahead of them? Well, I, I feel like Taves is already starting to turn old just because of the, the amount of, you know, hits he's taken and the mm -hmm. concussions and everything else. You know, he's definitely not the same player that he was. Um, they have some good young talent. I'm not so sure it's um, going to be on, on the trajectory to, to make them overly relevant with the core that they have left from the championship years because you know, those guys are old and they're slow and they – don't control the puck like they used to. They don't control the tempo like they used to. Yeah, they, they've got a lot of changing to do. And part of what's going to have to happen is they're going to need new leaders at the top of, of that roster because, you know, I, I love Jonathan Taves. I think there should be a, a dang statue of him somewhere at some point and, and his numbers in the rafters. But, you know, when, when you, you get to a certain point where physically you just can't keep up with, with some of the other uh, – other players on the ice. And as we saw, man, the, the Hawks lived on puck control and speed in their championship years. Th that's how every hockey team that wins a championship does it. And we just don't see either one of those things with the Blackhawks right now. Do you, do you think they can kind of get back into contention next season? Well, I mean, uh, you know, getting into the playoffs is certainly possible in the NHL. You got, you know, half the teams making the playoffs. I don't see them being a, a, a cup contender for, quite a while though still fun to watch some hockey though yeah so absolutely <laughs> it's a great game always always anything else for you Lamont uh, nope up oh, good as far as the black I mean that was good as far as the Blackhawks go <laughs> <laughs> all right thank you very much Brad Robinson from WBBM News Radio 780 105.9 FM home of the Bears uh, their coverage starts this Sunday at 9 a.m as they'll take on the Indianapolis Colts uh, three-hour pregame show, followed by kickoff at noon. Brad, thank you so much for joining us again today. Um, sorry I came in late, but you know, technology is a trip sometimes, but, you know, we got to power our way through it. You can follow Brad on Twitter at Brad Robinson, once again at Brad Robinson. Brad, thank you so much again for joining us. Let's do this again down the road, okay? Absolutely. Thank Anytime. You. Thank, thank you. you. Say, thank you so much, Brad. We got yeah, No got problem. Anytime. All right. Okay. Yeah. All right, that was all right. That was Brad Robinson from 780 WBBM News Radio. Um, to piggyback off what Brad was saying, you know, as far as the baseball is concerned, I mean, I, I think, like I said, I think for me, we'll see if Rick Hahn does decide to kind of give give you know Rick Renteria the hook. Because he made some really poor decisions. So, since he did get a chance to come in, uh, what did you think about some decisions that were made during that game three against the A's? 
<laughs> I'll speak as a fan first. It, it, it felt like that you were managing a little league team. Uh, uh, when the uh, pitcher that came in after Dave Dunning, he was injured. It seemed like every inning they had a plan to bring it in a new pitcher. It was <laughs> like you were playing and you are pitching scared at the same time. Yes, I know it's game three, winner take all to advance to the division series. We understand that. But it just figured that it, it was panic written all over their faces. I'm talking about uh, Rick Renteria and the rest of that management because we all say – in professional sports, sports period, but professional sports in particular, that the players carry the attitude of your head coach. And if that was the case uh, the other day in game three, the White Sox showed that even though they did battle back once again, but they came up short. Uh, if they give uh, Renteria the ax, I know there's a big White Sox uh, portion of White Sox fans will, that will be happy, but I, I don't think as Brad mentioned, that's not how they do business. They don't pull the hook too quickly. So I think Rick Renteria would, uh, will be back as manager next year. Now, um, I'll caution uh, White Sox fans this. This season was fun, even though it was short. But expect, even though the players didn't embrace the expectation level, even before this COVID thing hit, they didn't embrace the expectation of getting better and making it to the playoffs. They did that this year on a shortened schedule. Next year, when we go back to 162 games, it better be to advance to the playoffs. I want White Sox fans to put expectations on this organization. You, this thing, the kids can play era. This ain't the rebuilding era from two, three, four years ago. You are in the big leagues now, and whatever moves Rick Hahn make from this day forward should be towards the World Series championship. The, the, the excuses, the, the cute slogans, they are gone. They are officially gone. No more excuses. It's straight ahead towards that World Series championship. Yeah, I, I gotta agree with you, Sid. Uh, I, I was I was watching the game with my mother, and I was extremely frustrated by the eleven people that was left on base. And I think it was three times with the bases loaded, if I'm not mistaken, at least mm -hmm. times with the bases loaded. Yeah, that was that was really frustrating. And and like you say, Renteria, I like him and all, but I had mentioned it to Brad earlier. I think you gotta have some type of relationship with your pitching coach. And him and Coop don't even sit by each other. They barely talk to each other during the game. If you just watch their body languages during the game, it don't look like they're a cohesive unit in that clubhouse when they come to the head coach and, the, I mean, the manager and the pitching coach. So I'm thinking they may need to restructure something if we want something. And like you say, I'm putting expectations on something going into next year. That means it starts with the manager and the coach. And, I mean, I need y'all on one accord so us fans can be on one accord. And us broadcasters can broadcast much better things about you all. It'll be interesting to see what happens here because do they try to maybe get get a couple of veteran, maybe get another veteran arm? Do they maybe get another veteran, another bat, maybe an extra right-handed bat? Do they make a change in the managerial slot? I know Brad said no. I know some of, you know, what do you think, Sid? Do you, I know how you feel about it, Sid, or probably how you feel about it too, Lamont, but it'll be interesting to see if they, if they do get the, if Rick Renteria does get the hook, because I've seen a lot of people defend him. So at, at this point, who, who knows what Rick Hahn deci will decide? I just think they need to keep James McCann, though. Whatever they do, they need to keep McCann. Like I said before, I think Rick Terea is back for next year. But after that, if they don't meet expectations, then he's gone. Like, uh, uh, like I said for the last couple of years, I wanted Joe Girardi to manage this ball club. Of course, now he's in Philadelphia, and so that, that's not going to happen. If you fire Rick Terea now, who's out there? And uh, as far as I know, Ozzy. I don't know anybody that's out there besides Ozzy that's going to take this job. And you, if, you, if you guys uh, don't remember, Jerry Reinstar hired Ice again back in 2004. Remember, Kenny Williams didn't want Ice again. That wasn't his guy. Cito Gaston was his guy. And then, of course, Reinstar overruled him, and that's how that happened. Now, could that same scenario happen again if Ozzy wants to manage? Probably, but I, I think – I'm not going to say cooler heads have prevailed, but, we, you know, we all know that Ozzy again and Kenny had a, a – had a, you know, there was tension there in their relationship of – back in 2011. So have things cooled off enough? It should Renteria or the Sox struggle next year to give Ozzy the job again if he wants it? I don't know. But I'll say this just hypothetically speaking. Let's just say that 
the White Sox fail to make the playoffs next year or they don't advance past the division round. And if Isaac again wants that job, because we all know that he wants to manage again, and he's been doing television for the White Sox for the past three, four years. If you're Jerry Reinsdorf, do you overrule Kenny and Rick Hahn uh, to, to say, bring Ozzy in here? Because let's be honest here, if Ozzy is brought back, he will rejuvenate an already excited fan base because of the talent. Now, if you bring back Ozzy, they'll bring more fans back. You have the fans already uh, excited for, for, for next year, but if they don't live up to expectations next year, you want to keep this momentum going, give it another jump start a bit. Do you bring back Ozzy? That's yeah. the million dollar question. <sighs> yeah, that'll be, we'll, we'll see what happens during the off season. Um, going to the North side real quick with the Cubs, Cousin Marlins, like we mentioned, the, you know, the game two was postponed yesterday, quote unquote, due to weather. Again, I'm doing the air quotes <laughs> here. Um, it will be you Darvish versus Sixto Sanchez. They will be, first pitch will be in about 15 minutes. Do you guys think they can, do you think the Darvish has a good start and then that the Cubs will be able to force a game three? I'm going with, you see, I got the hat on for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> I'm already looking to game three. I'm worried about game three more than game two. And we ain't played game two yet. That's how much faith I got in the Cubs. Not wet in the bed today. They're going to go out there and they're going to hit those 100-mile-an-hour fastballs that they're going to be seeing, definitely. Because I think he hits 100, what, three or four times a game at least. So I think they will be seeing a lot of fastballs, and they should know that. If I know it, they got to know it. So I think they should hit their way on in the game three, and we worry about John Lester getting his, as Brad said earlier, ride off into the sunset start, if he's riding off into the sunset. I, I got the key. Yeah, I think the key for game two for the Cubs is, does you, Darvish, stay out of trouble early? and especially with, with the potential high pitch count. He's done well so far, especially early in the season. With that, if he doesn't fall behind hitters, he, I think he'll be okay. The key for me, another key for me is the Cubs offense, which Brad talked about earlier. They got to start waking up and producing runs because even though the temperature is supposed to be in the low to mid-50s, uh, you're not going to be hitting whole runs all out of the ballpark. And so you got to um, maneuver runners over – move them over from second to third and then button here and there. I don't know if the Cubs are geared towards doing that. So it's going to be interesting to see how do they produce offense without, uh, without the home run because we, uh, when we saw it with the White Sox, even though they started to do a little bit better in this series against Oakland, but back to the Cubs, uh, without the home run, the Cubs producing runs are just bad, just bad. <laughs> you know, I, I think it's going to – and I'm hoping it turns out like that game last night with that San Diego game. They couldn't do nothing until they hit that first big home run. And once they hit that home run, it's like a, a, a fire was lit. But I think with the Cubs, I think Javi Baez needs to hit that home run. I think he needs to hit it. Not just a home run. He needs a big home run or he needs a big Javi Baez play to give them that extra energy that they're going to need going forward. So that's who I'm looking for as they stay on TV, my pick to click or whatever today. It has to be hot. Oh, yeah. I think I think playing small ball, I think the Cubs are going to have to get used to it. And they show that they can do it. So, like you said, so it's going to be in the mid-50s. So we'll see how the Marlins adapt, adapt to it. It hasn't really affected them too much. But this will be the coolest weather that they'll be facing this year. So – We'll see what they do, and hopefully the Cubs can jump on, and I think Darvish will exercise those demons, and I think they'll win game two. Now, game three, it's a different story, but it's just you just got you got to win game two first. All right, you know, real quick before we take our break, the rest of the these um, first-round series or divisional series, however you want to interpret them. Um, wild card series. <laughs> well, we have wild card series. Uh, the Dodgers, you know, beat the beat the Brewers pretty handily. Like we we the four of us, you know, Jason as well. We expected that, so mm -hmm. not a big deal there. Um, the Braves, even though they played that that's really like strange, like fifteen innings where nobody wanted to score, but you know, but they were able to pull it off. They beat yeah. they beat Cincinnati, so they're on to the next round. Um, 
Self selfie. Exactly. He's so silly. Um uh, Houston, unfortunately, beat the Twins. This is the 18th straight year that the Twins hold on advance past the, the first round of the playoffs. Well, I, I said that Houston was going to turn back the clock and win that. I told you all that Houston was going to win that. Although Toronto did hurt me a little bit, I thought they would at least show up, even though they was young. I predicted Houston as well, so I was correct on that as well. <laughs> Great yeah. minds think like. I'll take yeah, I'll I'll take I picked Toronto. I'll take the I'll take the lumps. <laughs> I went to Toronto. I picked Toronto also. That's why I was hurt they didn't show up, man. They yeah. didn't show up. Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll take our lumps. Um uh, it'll be the A's and the Astros. That should be fun. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> in, the, <laughs> in the divisional round. Uh where do you guys see the Cardinals and the Padres for tonight? I think they woke up them bats. I think I think that 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 San Diego team when they start swinging, they could really swing, and they have fun doing it. I think as long as Tatis playing baseball, I think he give Machado what he needs. So I'm li I'm liking that boy there. I like him. Like I said, I picked the Colonels from the start, so I expect them to finish up with the Padres in the series. I don't, I don't know. Like I said, I picked the Padres, so we'll see. Um, the Yankees beat the Indians. You know, they, they made it interesting, <laughs> but they were able to pull it out, and they will face Tampa. And, oh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens with that. So, uh, yeah, so. You know, you that? Um, I picked the Yankees. This will be one of those things where I think they will. Remember all those times that they did play during the regular season, a lot of the guys weren't healthy. So I yeah. think now that the Yankees are fully healthy, I think this will probably be a back and forth um, series. So I think the Yankees, like I said, you know, t uh, Tampa will make it. Will make it interesting. They have a pretty good uh, lineup as well. What do you? What say you? Yeah, I think the Yankees. What they lost? How many times to them during the season? Eight or something like that. Yeah, but like I said, remember, well, the, 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 the yeah, they one was healthy. I think that's what I'm saying. I think they're going to have an attitude. I think they're going to try to try to cover off the ball. And as long as uh, that second starter, whoever they're using, is pitching well, they shouldn't have, I mean, they should win. They, they really should. Uh, as a fan, I'm rooting for Tampa Bay because uh, they don't get the respect that they deserve. Of course, I always give credit to manager Kevin Nash. He has those no-name players uh, playing hard and they're playing fundamentally sound baseball. I'm with you, Lamont. The Yankees should win this series. I think it will go the four or five game distance. The Yankees are healthy. You saw what they did against Cleveland. As we told you in our last podcast, uh, Cleveland's pitching, uh, starting pitch is not that strong. You saw what happened. And with that being said, this should be one hell of a series. I I'm really looking forward to this one. As an expert, I'm picking the Yankees in five, but I'm really rooting for Tampa Bay. Don't be surprised if they pull out the upset. They uh -huh. do have an edge uh, over the Yankees all. as far as regular season is concerned. But once the playoff starts, a whole different story. Yeah, I'm with you though, because I want Tampa to win, but I'm I, I'm going with the Yankees, but I want Tampa and my little heart to win. And just a reminder, the Dodgers will face the Cubs, Marlins. Oh wait, how does that work? Oh, the uh, the card. I think the I think the way it works is the Cardinals and the Padres winner, and the winner yeah. of the Marlins Cubs series they face the Braves. So. Yep. All right, so we'll see what happens there. So, all right, guys, let's take a, a really quick break. We'll begin our NFL Power Hour. We'll bring <laughs> you Colts and Bears, and we'll also have our Week Four NFL picks. I got Jason's right here in my my little text box here. So, <laughs> should be fun. Some good games this week. You know, some revenge games, also some. Uh, don't we don't want to face this team now that they lost. <laughs> portion of the schedule so for the guys i'm akina we'll be right back this is second stage sports zoom style zoom style zoom welcome back to our second segment of the weekend edition of second city sports zoom style zoom, zoom. zoom style Along with Lakina McGee and Lamont Scott, I am Sydney Brown. You can follow yours truly on Twitter and Instagram at CK80. Once again, at CK80. That's S I D K I D A zero. That's S I D K I D A zero. That's Lamont. You can watching us on YouTube. Is doing that Samuel Jackson dance from Jungle Fever. <laughs> Give me some money. 
and see in my fur. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> you can follow me at Lamont oh, Scott Jesus. on Facebook, Lamont Scott 69 on Instagram, and Lamont Scott 16 on Twitter. You can follow me at Kena McGee on Twitter and at Kena underscore McGee on the Instagram. All right, let's kick off the second. Oh, before we kick off the second segment, you can find Second City Sports along with the other programming from War Media, War on Anchor, which keeps you over to Spotify, SoundCloud, iTunes, Apple, Google Play, we're everywhere. Wherever you download your podcast, make sure you find War on Anchor. We're also on iHeartRadio. Please, please, please download the iHeartRadio app. And when you do, type in the search engine box, War on Anchor. And when you do that, you'll access all of our programming from We Are Regal Radio. And we also on YouTube at War Media. Just type in W-A-R-R Media, and you'll see our lovely faces. Voila! There we are. All right. So let's get right to it. we got a lot to get to in the second hour. Um, let's talk about Colts and Bears. This will be one of those injured it's your conference matchup, so where do you guys see this particular uh, opponent with the Colts? Uh, I'll start. You're going to see a dirty, grimy, hard-hitting, sloppy game being played over there, and I think it's going to be a situation that looks like an NFC Central game. I think it's going to be a lot of running the ball. I mean – Phillip Rivers get rid of the ball so fast so that defense probably won't get a chance to get to him too many times. So I think it's going to be a lot of smashing, a lot of running, and it's going to be pretty messy from what they're saying. So we're going to see. I think it's going to be muddy, but I do think it's going to be a good one. Yeah, that's supposed to be rain off and on. It's the forecast for Sunday's game. Uh, you're correct, Lamont. It will come down to the running game. Of course, for the Bears, you have David Montgomery. And for the Colts, no Marlon Mack for the rest of the year because of a torn Achilles, but they have a rookie running back named John DeTaylor. Uh, he rushed up for over 100 yards two weeks ago against Minnesota. He did okay against the Jets, but, of course, the Colts' defense overpowered Sam Donald and the Jets last week uh, on their way to a 33-7 to route. My keys to the, the game on Sunday for the Bears, you must run the football and on defense. Can you pressure Phillip Rivers? I want him to go down at least two to three times as far as sacks are concerned. And we all know that he could put it up at least once or twice per game as far as interceptions. Can that Bears Zebus create uh, a turnover, a huge turnover late in the game, especially given the w- weather conditions? If so, they will be in perfect z- position to win their fourth in a row. See, I see. I'm opposite. I think Jonathan Taylor, even though, yes, he's a rookie, he's kind of had to take the brunt of it with Marlon Mack. Now, you know, out for the rest of the year, I, I think this guy's already have almost 200 yards already. Um, but I, I think that, look, that all line for the Colts, you know, with Quentin Nelson and Ryan Kelly, that's a pretty formidable all line for the Colts. Especially if rain does become a factor, I think Taylor will be running the ball a lot. And that's probably good news, you know, for Phillip Rivers. That way you don't have to throw the ball so much because sometimes he does tend to throw – the red zone interception. So I would think that he'll probably be more of a factor here. Their defense is actually pretty good. He's still got the Forrest Buckner, a veteran. He got Darius Leonard, a veteran that's been a couple of pro goals. Xavier Rhodes is, an, you know, is still, still got it. I mean, I, he loves playing the Bears, you know, being a former Viking. So I think. Yeah, they six last week to start out that game uh, against the Jets. That's true. That's true. And, you know, I, I think that this will be one of those games where. Who can move the ball? Who can move the chains? And remember, Frank Wright coached Nick Foles. They were in Philly together when they won that Super Bowl. So I, I know some people are wondering that could the Foles have the advantage for over Wright? But no, if anything, I think Wright, especially now that the Colts know that he's going to be starting this game, I think that he'll see what his weaknesses are, and I think they're going to pressure him a lot more. Yeah, I, I got to agree with you, Lakina. I think um... – they will, and to give that offensive line credit and to give that running back credit. Any fans of the Big Ten, like myself, will know all about that running back. And I hate to see what he did to Illinois. Like, what, what he has done to the Big Ten while he was in college, we know what he can do. So if the Bears are not doing what they – I think we spoke about it earlier with Brad, that defense has to show up in a sense. We hope and Robert Quinn shows up, but someone needs to show up and show us that they are an elite defense. Like, I thought last week was the week where, 
okay, well, the defense needs to show us, okay, we're a real defense. Well, this game has a different situation because this is the first game that you got, quote, unquote, with the quarterback that you all want. So let's see what y'all going to do. Now y'all can't say y'all not doing it because y'all not into it because of Mitch. Y'all can say, let's go from the start. So I'm ready to see it happen. For the Colts, pay attention to these two guys uh, on their offensive side of the ball. Both their tight ends, Jack Doyle, who's their star tight end, but Mo Alley Cox is the other one. He's been getting a whole lot of run these last couple of weeks. I know he scored another touchdown last week and then went over the Jets. This kid is amazing. He's getting open down the seam. Jack Doyle, I know he's been injured here and there the last couple of years, but when he's healthy, he's one of the best underrated tight ends in the league. Mo Alley Cox and Jack Doyle. If the run game should work like Indianapolis wants it to work, they're going to use the play-action pass uh, that much more and get those two tight ends involved. As far as the wide receivers are concerned, uh, T.Y. Hilton O'Kenna, the Davis from that Davis show, hates him football-wise anyway. But I want to see if he plays, which I'm assuming he will. Uh, Cal Fuller is going to be matched up on him. I want to see those two, two go at it. Now, if it should rain heavily or consistently throughout the game, uh, like you said, like, you know, the Colts – will not throw the ball as much, but this should be one heck of a matchup with T.Y. Hilton and Kyle Fuller, should Kyle Fuller be assigned to, I'm assuming that he'll be assigned to guard T.Y. Hilton. And, and to piggyback off that, I was looking at uh, the network just now, and they were saying that Cordell Patterson will make a big impact this game, taking the place of Tariq Cohen and a lot of those plays out of the backfield. So, that may come out to be a point, and as far as I spoke with Brad earlier when he was on about our punt return situation, we need two punt returners. We need one that's going to do it, and we're going to need a backup in case he can't do it. So I think now we're looking at Anthony Miller and maybe in a case of an emergency, and it has to be an emergency only, Eddie Jackson. So that may come down to that also. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how they do against T.Y. Hilton, you know, has had, you know, kind of a slow start, but you know what? He's been able to make the big catches when he needed, needed to for the Colts, so that's going to be interesting. And I, I would, like I said, I would say that if, if it does rain heavily, I think they will be running the ball more. Can David Montgomery and Cordero Powers, can they kind of be sort of, you know, where they're going to put, are they going to put Cordero, you know, playing wide receiver where he's most comfortable, or will they be playing him in running back, or will Ryan Nall be used a little bit more? So, this is going to be interesting because I think in a team like Colts, I don't think you're going to be able to you know, have a slow start. I mean, I think we all know that, yes, you know, Philip Rivers does tend to throw, <laughs> throw a red zone interceptions. But like I said, if weather becomes a factor, I don't think Frank Wright's going to let him do that. So I, I think, look, I mean, this will be a battle and this should be a fun one. I mean, look, if weather does become an issue, if it does come to kicking, you know, it is like nine to six or six three or something like that. Yeah, you don't want that if you're the Bears. You don't want I'm sorry. I know we need to this last week. Don't bring that up, McKenna. We we try not to go down the kicking road. Mm-hmm. Now, as you already say, we didn't go, we didn't get into this last week, but if it comes down to kicking, uh, Santos uh, he missed yeah. an, uh, an easy field goal early in the game last week against Atlanta. You don't want to have to come down to that. Heaven forbid he struggles again, especially in those uh, potential awful conditions. You, hopefully, that doesn't have to come to that. Yeah. The re- yeah, it'll be, like I said, it's going to be interesting because if, if it does rain heavily, I think it will be the battle of, you know, who runs the ball better. But if it's not, and if it's just like maybe like maybe it rains earlier in the day and then as it gets, you know, gets, you know, lightened and clears up early later, later in the game. So we'll see. I mean, it's going to be interesting, though. I, I think this, like I said, who knows? We'll just have to wait and see. Uh, and one more key, key factor, Lakina, uh-huh. of the cold. The Colts' defensive front did get pressure on Sam Darnold. Mm-hmm. And let's be honest, too, the Jets' offensive line is not good. But on the other hand, Darius Leonard, my guy from South Carolina, says you mentioned earlier, the Kenny, third-year guy, uh, he can make some plays when, when healthy. Uh, their secondary is eh, at best. So, but when, when you get with Nick, when you do not get with Nick Foles, it's the mobility like with Trubisky has. But what will you get what, with Nick Foles is he can survey the field quickly and get the ball out to uh, the open guys. He will not make very many mistakes. And assuming that the Bears' offensive line, hopefully they don't have any dumb penalties like they did last week to start off again, as Jason mentioned in our last episode. If the offensive line just hold containment and give Nick Foles time, 
he should be able to make a couple of plays here and there to beat the Colts. Quick question before y'all switch. Do you think we gain more by losing Mitch's mobility and gaining Nick Foles' ability to go downfield? Which one do you think we gain more with? Uh, Mitch's mobility or Nick's ability to go down the field where Mitch couldn't? I say the latter. I say that, you know, yes, yeah, so it would be nice to have a build mobility, but I think the way that these guys, the defensive guys are hitting now, I think, yeah, I would much rather have a guy that can throw the ball for, and we know Foles can do that. Okay. Yeah, I'm, going about- with Nick Foles. I'm going with Nick Foles, too, because, yes, Trubisky's problem is that he cannot throw the ball downfield. If he does, he throws it into the wrong coverage and it gets picked off. Nick Foles is smarter that he won't make too many mistakes. So from the office that what Mag Nagy wants to run, and um, he wants to uh, throw the ball down the field, and Nick Foles can do that more consistently than Mitch. All right, um, our buddy Mark Groy just tweeted this out. The injury report for the Bears. Shriek McManus is doubtful due to a hamstring injury. Full practice for Deion Bush. Khalil Mack and Josh Woods are down as questionable. Mm. Yeah, so that, that needs been bothering Mack all season. So I hope it's not one of those things where it will only get worse further into the season. That's something to look out for. But I think yeah, they need to sit him down now. I, I would rather sit him down now and have him going to the rest of the seeds and then it play on it and play on it and it hurts us worse as he's not at 80% or whatever, however it may be. And plus they're going to get a couple of days off uh, anyway after this right. week's case because you have Tampa Bay again at home on Thursday, then they'll get a few extra days off. So like you said, Lamont, hopefully that Mac doesn't injure it any more further than it is right now. If that's the case, he'll get a couple extra days off. He should be ready to go when they play Carolina in a couple weeks. All right. So, on that note, oh, maybe not. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I, I think this is going to be interesting, though. Like, I, I hopefully that, that injury is not permanent, but uh, we'll see. Now, on that yeah. note. All right, and we're all within one game of each other. Well, except Jason, because Jason didn't have his picks, his picks in last week. I have them this week, but uh, we're only about a game apart, the three of us. So, okay. we'll see what they do. Yeah, we're, who's the leader? Here, you are. You are Sid. Damn you right. <laughs> <laughs> we know you the leader. This is the week where you get caught. All we'll right. see about that. <laughs> oh, we'll, see. we'll see about that. Uh, all right. We so, said I'll talk about a prize off mic. Yeah, let, let's yeah. yeah, well, we got to do that. Um, well, we got some time. We got, we, we're not even halfway through the season yet. Um, okay, Ravens and Washington. So I think I have a feeling that we're how we're all going to pick, but uh, go ahead. Who wants to go first? I think I got Baltimore. I'm going with Baltimore. They should be mad. I see Jim Harbaugh catching static about talking to the official without a mask. So he mad. Everybody mad over there in Baltimore. So let's see. I'm going with Baltimore. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm, John's not going to be in a very good mood. You don't want to face angry Ravens. I'll just put it that way. <laughs> hey, that's, that's, they might. And, and it's not like, look, it's not like they're going across because they're going across the, the Potomac River, okay? They're going to land over in Maryland. So. I think, uh, yeah, I think they better look, the, the Washington better look out, and I think the Ravens, the Ravens will win handily, and Jason has the Ravens as well. And be uh, careful, be careful if, if Young is playing on that defensive side with Lamar Jackson running that ball, that he don't take no unnecessary pain, because Washington front line can dish out pain, and hopefully he doesn't take any unnecessary pain shots. Well, yeah, I think, yeah, that, that injury to Chase Young will definitely be something to look out for. All right. Um, next up, we got Chargers and Tampa. Mm. I'm going with Tampa. Me too. I think I pay Tampa, I pay Tampa too, and Jason also has Tampa Bay. Um, Seattle and the Dolphins. Uh, I know I'm going with Seattle. Because I don't believe in my I think this is, Yeah, I think this is going to be a close one, but I'm going with Seattle. 
Yeah, I think it's going to be a close one, too. I think, you know, with Seattle having to travel across country and a noon game. But I think they pull away, like, because, you know, the talent's there. And I think Russell Wilson has a big, big date, big day on Sunday. And okay. Lamar, Lamar okay. Jason also has the Seahawks. Okay. Uh, before we move on, like, before we move on, Lakina, I'll ask Lamont, uh, take a wild guess. Guess who's calling this game for Fox? The Seattle uh -oh. uh, uh, Miami Stop. game. Dick stopped it and who? <laughs> One more game for the people in the back of the bus. Yeah, Dick Stop <laughs> and who? Who who with him? Yeah, Bra yeah, Brady Quinn and Sarah Walsh. <laughs> oh, okay. I like Sarah. Yeah, I like Brady. Brady does like a good job. I like Sarah too, so. Yeah, so I'm fine. Yeah, I'm fine with that. I think this shouldn't be too bad. Yeah, let her talk more than Dick Stop. <laughs> oh wow! Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, this is uh, the battle of zero and three, and all. <laughs> okay, the battle of zero and three teams, and very you know all the weird things that happened during the week for the Minnesota Vikings. Their game, their game is a go against the Texans. They're both zero and three. Where do you guys see this game? I'll start off, Lamont. This is for you. I've been thinking about this all week. This okay. game between Minnesota and Houston, this should be the link card ball. Whoever loses the game will be oh. shown with the petty of link cards. <laughs> so whoever wins, they'll survive. Whoever loses will get their pink slip and their link cards. With that being said, I will go with Houston because they're the home team. You know what? I – I don't know how I overlooked this, but Minnesota will not win that game. Uh, I don't think Houston will do enough to lose because I think he's heard our showdown in Houston, and he know that his job may be on the line if they continue to lose. Plus, they can give that boy that money at quarterback. So something has to give. So I'm going to go with Houston. I'm going to pick Houston, too, but I'm not very confident in that. <laughs> so, but, uh, yeah, I mean, with all the weird things that have been going on with that whole game, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But, you know, Minnesota's not been very good, and neither have the Texans. Somebody's got to win this game. So, yeah, I'll be good. I think Houston needs to win it more than Minnesota does. That's true. That's true. But I think if you're Minnesota, you want to try and, you know, get this win to kind of like jumpstart your confidence and try to maybe perhaps make it interesting in that NFC North. So we'll see. And Jason also has the Texans. So a sweep there. All right. The battle of one and twos, you got Saints and Lions. I'll, I'll start. Uh, Michael Thomas will be back. And the Saints uh, can't afford to lose anymore if they want to be taken serious, number one. And if they want a good spot in the playoffs, they can't afford to lose anymore. So I'm going with the, an angry Saints team at that. And I think Drew Brees' record with Michael Thomas out of the game, I don't think he's won. I, I mean, I have to double check that, but it doesn't look good when Michael Thomas is not playing for Drew Brees. So he'll be back. So they should be back on track. And I look for them to get something started. Lamont took the words out of my mouth. I'm going to New Orleans on the road. Same here. I got New Orleans, and so does Jason. Jason's also got the Saints as well. All uh, right. You got a pretty good one here. You got the Browns and the Cowboys. Uh, um, well, I will start. Dallas needs to win, or it's going to be problems in, in Jerry World. Cleveland going in there, they think they're ready, they're being better, but I think Dallas needs to use Zeke more and win the game like they're supposed to. I mean, it's a lot of pressure on Dallas right now, and Jerry won't be happy if they lose this one at all. I'm going with the Cowboys as well. To keep an eye on the Cowboys front four, can they pressure Baker Mayfield and force him into a couple mistakes, and can they limit the run game of the Browns because Kareem Hunt and Nick Chubb have been running the ball very well as a tandem so far as the start of this, this young season. If the Cowboys can do those two things, they should win going to rank. But I think it's going to be a close one. But uh, I got faith that the Cowboys will pull off this one. I agree. I think the Cowboys will pull this off. You know, they'll pull away late, I think. You know, they're going to have to slow down. That that secondary – I mean, that, that front seven is going to have to slow down Chubb and – uh, Hunt. I just think that that's going to be the key. And if not, Dak and them are going to be on off the field. So, and heads will roll if Dallas loses this game. So I think this is more <laughs> certainty for the Cowboys and I think they will win. And so does Jason, they, he picks the Cowboys too. 
Yes. Everybody, uh, have all the games been sweet? We've all picked the same thing so far, right? I know. Yes, yes. It looks that way. <laughs> okay, yeah. we'll, see if we do, uh, we'll see what we do on this next one. He got the Jaguars and the Bengals. Uh, 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 uh. I'll go then. Uh, I'm predicting that LSU quarterback Joe Burrow gets his first win in Cincinnati. They're in Cincinnati. I don't think Jacksonville can travel. I think the weather will be bad up there this weekend. Also, I think Cincinnati wins this game. It's at Cincinnati, correct? Yep. Yep. Yeah, Cincinnati hasn't played all that bad this year. Like you mentioned, Lamont, Joe Burrow has come out to play. If he just get an offensive line, which far would be in the next year, so he he really, he would really be a, a very good quarterback. But with that being said, Jacksonville, uh, I, I know they got embarrassed uh, last Thursday night against Miami at home. I'm st I am like a couple of their parts on offense, but I'm still not a believer in them overall. Cincinnati has been playing well to start out the year. They uh, Even though they – quote, unquote, gave that game away to Philadelphia that ended up in a tie. I still like that team much better. They're on the upright. So I'm going with Cincinnati at home. Yes, sir. I'm also going to pick Cincy. And like I, like I said, they're probably the best 0-2-1 oh, team. So I, they've been right there with all three of their games. So I think Cincinnati will get their first win of the season. And so there's Jason. He has Cincy as well. All right. All right. <laughs> Oh God, we got it. We got to start picking different. Okay, last of the <laughs> noon games. Well, outside of the Colts and Bears game, we got Cardinals and the Panthers. I'll start this one off. I think Cardinals. I know this is like a cross country noon game. Okay, yada yada yada. But they've actually done well in those in those games. So I think Cardinals has a bounce back game. I know. Look, I know the Panthers look look good last week against the Chargers, but I just I just don't. I think the the Cardinals have the better team and they have the better talent and I think they it will be close but I think they will pull away late uh as always the king of me and you we riding with Arizona right that's our goal for the year we're gonna ride with Arizona I'm riding with Arizona I mean uh, Kyler Mary have he'll have a bounce back game I'm, they're gonna they're gonna take care of the business on uh Carolina they're gonna take care of it I know Carolina took advantage of the Chargers injuries on defense last week of course no Christian McCaffrey for the next few weeks but Arizona, if you want to be a playoff team, you must win tough games on the road. Hopefully they'll learn their lesson for giving that game away last week to the Detroit Lions at home. They have to go on the road. They are the better team, as you mentioned, Lakina. I'm putting the pressure on them. I expect them to win this ball game. So I'm going with Arizona. And Kirk, uh, Christian Kirk looks like he's going to be a go-to, so I think that's, that's, a, that's a big difference for that. So we'll see if he can put the pressure on Teddy Bridgewater. But Jason said that out. He, got, he has the Panthers. Uh-oh. So, yeah, so our first, our first is lonely great. out there, Jason. It's lonely out there, brother. <laughs> <laughs> we know how he feels about that, uh, that Arizona team. I'll just leave it at that. Yeah. But uh, the first of the three o'clock slate, you got the Giants and the Rams. Um, I'll start this off. I think the Rams are going to be not going to be very happy that they felt that they should have won the game at Buffalo. So, I think Aaron Donald's not going to be very happy. And if I were Daniel Jones, I would try to run run as fast as he can and I, I think Jared Goff's gonna have a big day and yeah I think the Rams win it he, he can't get away though he can try but he won't get away I think <laughs> Aaron's gonna take out all his frustrations on that quarterback so I'm going with the Rams too I think the Giants will play a little bit better the, they stunk it up last week at home against the 49ers as you mentioned Lakina the Rams are mad for uh blowing uh for um for that bad pass interference call against Buffalo last week, which cost them the game. And I will go with the Rams. For those of you in the Chicago area, you will be, you'll be able to watch that game live because Chicago's very own Adam Amin, a, a new Bulls TV announcer, will be calling that game, along with Mark Schlereth and Lindsey Zarnier. Yay! Love Adam. Love Adam. Uh, yeah, and also Jason also has the Rams, so we got a sweep there. Should, right. be good, should, be good one, should be a good one here in the divisional matchup. We got the 3 0 Bills against the Two and one Las Vegas Raiders. Yay, I got it right. <laughs> yeah, you got it right that time. Yay. Too, too bad they won't get it right. <laughs> they won't get it right at all this time because I think this is what you call Josh Allen's coming out party as to show people that he's a consistent starter in the NFL. I think he's going to march in there 
and he's going to win that game. Hand, I, I'm not going to say handily, but maybe about 10. But I do look for Buffalo to show them that they're a real team. And no better place to do it than in Las Vegas. The, the, the Las Vegas Raiders had a bad taste of their mouth at New England last week. They looked good in the first two games to start off the year. They're back at home. I think it's going to be a closer game than what people give it credit for. I'll be watching that game because of yours truly being smarter than everyone else because the Patriots and and Chiefs will be playing nationally on CBS. I'll be watching that Bills Raiders game via my computer. <laughs> with that being said, I will go with the Raiders. Uh -oh. All right. Uh, huh? I'm, I'm with you, Lamont. I look, I, I think that, like I said, I, I don't think that, I think it goes without saying that this will probably be the mo one of the more entertaining ones outside of, of course, Patriots. He's what we're going to get to in a minute. But like I said, I think the you know I think the Bills are kind of riding that high, and I think as long as Josh Allen doesn't make any mistakes, he'll be okay. And you know, Michael Hyde looks like he's going to be a go as well. I'm going to. Uh, it's going to be probably very close, but I'm picking the Bills, and I think they pull away late. And the and Jason has the Raiders, so we'll see. It should be a good one. Yes. Oh, Lakina. Uh, yes. Quick question. Guess who's calling that game for CBS? The Bills Raiders game. Oh, the Bills Raiders. Oh, I thought I saw it somewhere. Um, I saw what you call uh, tweeted it out, but uh, yeah. But who is it? Spiro Diaz. Spiro oh, Diaz, friend of the show. Oh, I love it. Oh, okay. So should, him and Adam Archuleta. Archuleta. Yeah, him and Archuleta. They got a good one there. So that should be a good one there out there in Las Vegas. <laughs> that should be a fun one. All right. You know, speaking of that game of the week, uh, this is probably the game of the week. You got the Patriots and the 3 0 Chiefs. Who calling that game? That's probably the best. Uh, yes, Jim Nance, uh, Tony Romo, and Tracy I Wilson. Think, I knew you was going to say it. Is this uh, so a we, top team? Yeah. I know, but we, yep. I mean, it's just weird when Tony Romo's calling Kansas City games. I mean, he takes love to a whole new level when he calls Kansas City. <laughs> you know he loves his quarterbacks. You know he does. <laughs> you know he loves his quarterbacks. He's a exceptional job, but he is in love with the Kansas City quarterback. So, uh, and then what I saw out of Mahomes the other night, and it's scary almost, what? What's going to happen when he learns how to read defenses completely and constantly? That that can get real scary. And I think that's the step that he's taking. That's what it looked like against Baltimore. It's like he got a different understanding right now. It's like he's learned some stuff. So that could be real dangerous. And if that defense hold up, Kansas City going to be something to reckon with. I think he's going to show the world that he's figured out Belichick, and he's going to probably try to embarrass them. So I'm going with Kansas City. And I think they're going to make a statement. It's going to come down to the running uh, backs for both teams. You got uh, LeClaire, if I pronounce his name correct. Uh, well, I, for I, Kansas. I, Lahair, Clyde sorry. Is Hilaire. 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 Uh, Hilaire. Not He's e -Claire, be I guess. I guess you know, Steve Louis, Steve Louis said e, -La e Lair was like, wait, is it a Claire? Like, I, have I ever mispronounced Lahair, his name right. all this time? My bad. <laughs> well, it's going to come down to Lahair for Kansas City, and it's going to come down to Sony Michelle for the Patriots. You got to have somebody to take pressure off Cat Newton running those quarterback boulets because better defense is going to read that and, it, and they're not going to be fooled. With that being said, I'm going with Kansas City at home. If yeah, if this was if this was in New England in Foxborough, I probably would pick the Patriots because they've actually been better than I think a, I think a lot of us expected. But since it's at Arrowhead, Casey's on a high right now. It's going to be entertaining. It's going to be close, but I picked the Chiefs because that Arrowhead. And, oh, Jason stepped out again. He has the Patriots. Uh-oh. All right. <laughs> well, he has to catch up, so we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. Separation, not stepping out anymore. That separation is what he's creating. <laughs> All right. Uh, oh, this is not a very good one Sunday night. I'm sure NBC will wish that they could have flexed this game out to Eagles and 49ers. Huh. You, you get a you get a healthy San Francisco team, so to speak. They get what I think they're getting three of those players back. I think I know Kittle say he's gonna play for sure. Uh, I don't believe in Carson Wentz at all, um, so I'm taking San Francisco. Uh. Yeah, you can start playing taps for both of these teams, but I think uh, the uh, the taps on should the extended version should go to the Philadelphia Eagles. I'm going with San Francisco at home. 
Yeah, I've got a big Sam Fran at home. But look, Nick Mullins has not made any big mistakes. He only has like, like, like an inter one interception in the two games he's played. You know, Jerry McKinnon's been doing do, been playing well as well. We'll see if Mostert's able to play. We'll see if Garoppolo's able to play. I don't think that's gonna make a difference if they don't. So I think the 49ers and sorry, sorry, Al, Chris, and Michelle. I, we're, I'm, I apologize if the, the game ends up, ends up being not very good. <laughs> I'll be surprised if the ratings are real high for this game. I will be really surprised. Yeah. Especially going up against the finals too. So we'll we'll see if that gets a bigger rating than yeah. this game. Um yeah. With that game, before you jump over that San Francisco game, uh -huh. you know, I was listening to some San Francisco radio, and they they saying that it's some rumblings that Nick Mullins has really, really liked in that locker room with that head coach and different things. And even though they gave Jimmy G all that money, if Nick Mullins continue to play and Jimmy G continue to stay not healthy, it may cause a controversy eventually. I'm just shooting it out there early. If he show off in this game, like I said, he only, he's only has thrown one interception. You know, in the two games he's played, so this yeah. is a key year. He's been he's fast, been able to make any big mistakes, and he hasn't. So, if he yeah, show well, Lamont step up. Yeah, Lamont stand up in this game. Listen to other sources, other out out of town radio. Solid Lamont. Yeah, love what you do. gotta love that. Um, Jason's actually picking the Eagles. So separation. We'll Separate. see. Brothers. All right. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Monday night, you got the 0-3 Falcons. That shouldn't be 0-3, but again. but all, And also you got the 3-0 Packers. Uh, they shouldn't be 0-3, like you said. What's I'm, your, what's your if I'm going with the upset. I'm going with Atlanta. Atlanta will win. Ooh, okay. Ooh. Yes. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yes, Atlanta will win this game. I'm not picking Green Bay at all. Atlanta will win the game. I think Atlanta will play much better, but they won't will not blow a 20 point lead. You know why? Because they won't have a 20 point lead. Okay. Like you mentioned, like, you know, Aaron Rodgers is playing much better. Um, yeah. Put my Bears fan up to the side for a minute. Aaron Rodgers is playing lights out. Their Atlanta defense, especially their secondary, stinks. Their defensive yeah. line stinks. Yes. And running that ball with Aaron Jones, what more can you ask for? Like I said, Atlanta will play a little bit better, but uh, Green Bay is the better team. They should win this one going away. So I have Green Bay at home. Yeah, yeah I'm, I know Devont. Yeah, I know Devont Adams isn't probably will not play. I think they'll both they'll you know they'll be cautious with him, but I don't think that's going to matter. He's got you know Rodgers got other guys to throw to. That secondary is awful. They're going to take a full advantage of it. He'll probably have five or six touchdowns. So, for those of you who have – He'll have five. He'll have five. It's going to be like a 42-35 type situation. <laughs> Green Bay ain't stopping nothing back there they sell. <laughs> so, I'm, look, I'm looking at a big shootout. What's the over-under on there? I think it got to be 70 at least. I, I, I'm going – I'm Atlanta going to outshoot them. Yeah, look you it up real quick, Lakina. Okay. Let me see if I can find it. Um, okay, just for the record, Jason has the, the Packers, but – I mean, I don't know. We'll we'll see. Let me see if I can look that up right quick. Yeah, the over and under for the Packers and Falcons. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's going to be a shootout, and I think uh, Atlanta's going to outshoot them. They're going to have a couple of extra bullets. All right, let me see if I can look this up right quick. Don't be surprised if Todd Gurley – Okay, 58. 58. Yeah, 58. I think it's over. It's definitely going over 58. Okay, uh, Lamont said it's over. The, he's, they're gonna go over the total. That means both teams yeah. score over thirty points. Yeah, I guess what he's saying it's gonna be a basketball score. I guess. I'm, really that's, that's <laughs> I'm, I told you I'm looking at like a forty-two thirty-five type hey, situation. Uh, hey, how are you? Yeah, you, yeah, you heard it here. Heard it here. Heard it here first, folks. Lamont Scott said that the Packers and Falcons will go over the total of plus that fifty-eight and a half. Looking yeah, fifty-eight. No, huh? fifty-eight. Just fifty-eight. Not fifty-eight and a half. Fifty-eight. So. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we'll, we'll see. At, okay, we'll see. you guys should record it. <laughs> yes. All right, all right. Uh, okay, last but not least, Colts and Bears. And we've got the pretty good trio of Greg Gumbo, Rich Cannon, and Amanda Bolonis. Bolonis, I think that's how she says the name. I've been trying to – Bolonis on the call. So that should be a, a – that's a nice tandem. That should be a good one. Um, yeah, Greg Gumbo, Chicago's very own. Yeah, so that should yeah. be – that should be fun. Uh, so, okay, what are your uh, what are your predictions? Go Bears! I think the Bears will do enough to pull it off. I think I think the defense will play motivated because they get a 
quarterback that they want, quote unquote, from the start of the game going forward. I think the defense will show up for real this time, and we're going to see some hitting and some turning over. I don't think that um, – I think the Bears will win this game, but you don't need Nick Foles to do a lot. You just need him to control the ball and make the right passes at the right time. This will come down to the running game, in particular Dave, Dave Montgomery. And I'm with you, Lamont. That defense better step up and make a couple of sacks and create at least one to two turnovers. This is a game for them, barring the weather conditions. I'm going with the Bears. This, like I said, this will be one of those games where it might be 6-3, 9-6 or something like that. I know you guys don't want to hear that, but I, I'm picking the Colts. No. I'm picking the Colts. I think, look, I think Wright knows what makes Foles tick, and I think that he's going to take full advantage of that. That pass run is going to be really good. I think Leonard's going to have a good game. It's going to be close, but I'm picking the Colts. That's what oh. we're going to say. Remember this stat. In Nick Foles' career versus Indianapolis, he is 5-2. and two. Once again, Nick, Nick Foles versus the Colts in his career is 5-2. and two. Okay. All right. And, all right. For the record, Jason has the Colts, too. Okay. Yeah, just real quick before we move on, Lakina, we got Lam La Lamont's uh, Sunday uh, set up. How many TVs do you usually watch the football on, Lamont? Two, three? Three. I three. Two. Okay. I put my computer. Okay, so see, like you, you watch the auto market market games like I do uh, yeah. via your computer. So he's going to have the Bears on the big screen. He's going to have Seattle, Miami on the other screen <laughs> watching Dick Stockton, and then later he's going to have the, the Chiefs and the um the Chiefs and the um Patriots with, with Tony Romo. So you good to go? <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna work, I'm gonna work the three. I, I don't they I don't know if they do it with the NFL, but they do it with college. They got the game that they show you with no announcers. Um, I think they call it set set something uh, with the with the Xfinity package. They do it with all of the with some of the college games where they just show you the rough cut of the game with no announcing, only announcing. Oh, okay. Oh, that's what you're saying. Yeah, you hear the, uh, I think it's called SAT something, like satellite something. And you hear the just the call of the uh, PA announcer. All right. That's the only, yeah, and that's how I watch most of the college football games. I watch like two or three games like that a weekend simply because of that feature. All right. That's, that's a nice setup there. I got to check that out. Um, that's, why, that's why my game will be $270. <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, my. Uh, all right. Uh, rapid fire here. We got a few minutes left. <laughs> you get what you pay for. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Rapid fire. I mean, yeah. So I, I paid for all the extra stuff. Then I had to have the stars and the HBO. So, yeah, my, I, I set aside a strict budget simply for that. But it gives me like a lot of out of market stuff. So I'll be happy with that. Oh, interesting. All right. And those are week four picks for the NFL. All right. So rapid fire here for the NBA finals. Looks like Jason might have been right, but what do you guys what do you guys think? Do you think that he can tie it up tonight? What Jason called it a gentleman sweep. I think that's yep. the term. Yep. I don't know how gentlemen like they're gonna be about it, but I think if Miami don't win tonight, it might be a complete sweep, not a gentleman sweep. It may get ugly around there, and <laughs> I don't want it to. Like I really want Miami to go in there, and, you know, hit him in the mouth. Like I said uh, last week, I think I want Miami to do something special, at least win two. But we gonna see tonight. It starts tonight, though. Yeah, the injuries have caught up to the heat with Bam out of I don't think he's going to play Gordon Drogic. I don't think he's going to play. Uh, I don't think he's going to play either. So it's going to fall under uh, Jimmy Butler and Duncan Robinson. It, it's, uh, it's, they're going to compete hard, but I think it's asking too much for the Heat. So I expect the Lakers to, to take Game Two. I still have the series going six, but like you said, Lamont, if the Heat went to. I mean, if the Lakers win Game Two, especially going away like they did in Game One. This series will be over by the time we commence next week. But know, know what you should look for tonight? The coming out party of Chicago's own. None should he, he should I'm show up. He may show up and show out. It's in him. He's he's you know he's one of us. So it's in him. So if he shows up, that could change the dynamic right there. They can use that 20, 25 that he making toss in there. 
and that'll allow Duncan and Hero to do what they do. So he play a bigger part than I think most people are giving attention to or paying attention to at all. I mean, it still looks like Bam Bam may have to take a shot to that shoulder area. We know he's not a big fan of needles. <laughs> so he may have to take the quarter zone shots. Um, you know, Dragic is going to be out. And I know you say, I know he's going to try playing. He wants to try play game two. They're not going to let him. Um, so I think, look, I said, I said Lakers in six, but I'm starting to doubt that at this point. If they don't win tonight, I think it mm. will end up being a sweep. Yeah, it's going to get ugly. It's going to get ugly. It's going to get ugly quick. So, again, like I said, we'll, we'll, we'll see. All right. Um, let's see. Oh, college football this weekend. There have already been a couple of games that have postponed. I think it was Appalachian State and Louisiana. They, I think it was App State because I think a student died from COVID. So, I don't know if that student was around some of the players, but – they're being quarantined. I think they were a couple of them were positive. Too. I think there was an outbreak at, over there. So that game is going to be postponed. Um, let's see what else here. Uh, I mean, Al- Alabama and AM, that might be a good one. Um, let's see. You so again, that should be good that no one's going to watch probably the LSU Vanderbilt game. LSU may lose. I mean, they shouldn't, and they don't supposed to, but that's the SEC, and, and I'm, I'm waiting to see what happens. And I, I'm also going to watch that Mississippi State game to see if Mr. Costello can show up two weeks in a row. I thought it was Alabama and Auburn, Lakina, it's not? Yeah. No, no, no. That, that, no, no, you got, you're getting mixed up. That's Auburn and Georgia. Auburn and Georgia, that's right. I'm really looking forward to that one. That should be a fun one there. We'll see if George Georgia almost had to kind of like slug it out against Arkansas. We'll see if they found mm-hmm. their quarterback. Um, OU and, L- and uh, L- Iowa State, I should say. We'll see how mad Oklahoma is after uh, letting the game against Kansas State slip away. Um, <laughs> They're not predicting Oklahoma to do much, huh? They think Oklahoma might wet the bed again. Yeah, that, that's what they're saying. But although, look, Iowa State had their – had their issues earlier, you know, a couple of weeks ago. We'll see if they can bounce back from that. I think uh, they need, need it more. They can get some respect. A lot of people ain't giving them no respect when they say their name. So if they win this game, even though uh, they're on the, the other team's on a the decline, they still gain some measure of respect. We'll see. Should be fun. Um, let's see what else here. Uh, the French Open. I'm just, look, I'm just hoping for a Nadal Djokovic final on the men's side. I would just, I just want that. Please. I think that's, it, look, all we want. that's all we want. That's all we want. Can we get that? If we can get that final, we can be good. It was worth going over there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, I know, look, I'm sure Nadal wants to show that he's the king of clay for a reason and Djokovic wants to redeem himself after what happened at the U.S. Open, so that should be, hopefully we can get that. Um, the women's side, I think it's, it's wide open with Serena not being, you know, haven't had to withdraw because of the Achilles injury. Doesn't sound very good if you read her statement. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so I think Halep and also Sophia Cannon, don't forget about her. You know, she's, she got to the third round. So I'm sure she wants to show people that she's not no one grand slam wonder. So we'll yeah. see what happens there. Uh, yeah. So it should be, French Open should be a fun one there. Um, anything else, you guys, you know, that's on your mind sports-wise for this weekend? Mm-hmm. Well, you know, with me, as always, I got another pay-per-view this week. So, you know, I'll be looking at that, as always. Uh, other than that, I'm, I mean, I'm looking, I'm looking at some of these moves that some of these NBA teams are making. I've been doing a lot of listening and behind-the-scenes searching about what they're doing and trying to see who's going to make some quick moves. Like I say, I don't really like what KD and Kyrie were saying about they don't really need a head coach. They can collaboratively coach themselves. So I kind of want to see what direction that goes in going forward. Does Steve Nash step up and say something and defend his position as head coach? So I, I think he needs to say something. So I'm looking to hear something out of that. And I want us to win right now. I'm looking at this game and – Zero, zero, and we're not winning yet. So I want us to win so I can continue to watch us play baseball this weekend. 
Thank goodness we won't be watching the Cubs Sox World Series on a different soil, so I'm relieved of that. Yeah, but, you know what? That's why it didn't happen. They wasn't the next year when the Cubs <laughs> move and the White Sox make a half a move, and they continue to get there. Uh, as I'm looking forward to, it's always another fun-filled Sunday of NFL football. Even though there wouldn't be uh, a lot of late NFL games, have been NFL's been doing it a whole lot lately with doing that. Uh, making a few late games at the clock hour, but that's the boot. Also, the baseball playoffs are happening, and these NBA finals probably will be over by the time we commence next week. So that's what uh -huh. I'm looking forward to. Yeah. It might, it might be. Yeah, that might be. You might be right about that. Said Jason will probably come in on Monday saying, I told you so. So. Yeah. So we'll I see yeah, we'll see what happens with that. Um, week four, those are like some good matchups. So, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to uh, week week four of the NFL. I'm listening to, you know, looking forward to Premier League as usual. So, uh, yeah, and also hopefully the Cubs can you know, win and extend their season because I really want to see one of our Chicago teams go, you know, go far in these playoffs. But we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it. We'll commence about it on Monday. But, uh yeah, so on, and also college football too, you know, do you guys think that they should extend, well, we'll get into this more with Jason next week, but do you guys think they should extend the playoffs? Because they've already said they're not going to, which I think is kind of stupid, but. Yeah, I, I think they do. I mean, I, I thought that a year ago. I mean, it's, they need more than four teams. I, I mean, just, they need more. I mean, you got all of those bowls anyway. At least start making some of them worth something. You can have a situation where you have a few of the bowls lead into bigger bowls, so to speak, like the Independence and the Next Tail Bowl and the, all of those bowls can lead up to the bigger bowls and add a few more teams into it. Yeah, like I said, we'll get into this more next week, but you always said eight teams and then they'll, the NCAA will stop it. Of course, the big uh, undermining all this the worst kept secret is gambling. The more games, especially college football, you have that's worth something, the more people will gamble on them. So if yeah. people don't realize that by now, you're stupid. And I, and I think that uh, I think Mississippi State has Arkansas, if I'm not mistaken, this yep. week. Yep. So mm -hmm. I'm, 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 like I said, I think that's game is going to be on. I know it's on the SEC network. I don't know what time, but I know it's on there. And the LSU game going to probably be on there also if it's not on uh, regular TV. So. I'm looking at that. See, can they find themselves a quarterback? They need a quarterback. All right. And on that note, you follow me at Keenan McGee on Twitter. I can underscore McGee on the Instagram. You can follow me at Lamont Scott on Facebook, Lamont Scott 69 on Instagram, Lamont Scott 16 on Twitter. You can follow me, Sid, Sid the Kid, on Twitter and Instagram at Sid Kid 80. Once again, at Sid Kid 80. As LeBron does his silly dance you're watching on YouTube, give <laughs> us <you> some money. <laughs> That's S I D K I D eight zero. That's S I D K S I D K I D eight zero. S I D K I D eight zero. Both on Twitter and Instagram. And you can follow this show along with our other programming from We Are Regal Radio at uh, War on Anger. They kick you over to Spotify, SoundCloud, Apple, iTunes. We're everywhere. Wherever you download your podcast, please search for War on Anchor. And we're also on iHeartRadio. Please, please, please download the iHeartRadio app when you do. Just type in War on Anchor in the search engine box, and you'll find our programming, including Sega City Sports, on there. And also, we are on YouTube. That's War Media. That's W-A-R-R -R Media. Type it in your search engine box on YouTube. Well, voila, there, there we are, along with all the programming from War Media as well. You see our lovely faces. Yeah. All right. So stay warm out there, guys. It's going to get a little chilly this weekend. So well, it's going to warm up next week for my birthday. <laughs> When's your birthday? When's your birthday? Wednesday. Wednesday. That's the uh, seventh? Yep. That's the seventh. Mm -hmm. That's the seventh. Okay. All right. All right. So all right, so for the guys, I'm Lakina. This is Second City Sports Zoom style. And stay safe out there and wash your hands, folks, and wear your mask correctly. Go Bears! Holla! <laughs>